Good morning. Good morning. Live in three, two, go. Good morning, world. Whether you're in Amsterdam or Haiti or somewhere in Africa, even down under, we're coming to you live from Atlanta. This is The Daily Huddle. My name is Sorrel Ketan. The co-founder of The Daily Huddle is Giovanni Gonzalez. We're here every single day, and today we've got a phenomenal conversation for you, one centered on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And to begin the day, I have a question for our honored guest. Bertine, good morning. Good morning, Sorrel. Good morning. I have a question for you, Bertine. Of course. What did Arnold Schwarzenegger say to the movie execs when he found out they wanted more diversity in the Terminator movies? I would love to know. What did he say? I'll be black. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Good morning and welcome back. We are here live. And today's question goes like this. How do you take the theoretical stuff about diversity, equity, and inclusion and make it real for business owners, human beings, and small businesses like us or even big corporations who don't quite get it and understand it? I'll phrase the question in, in, uh, in the way it's written and before we get started, I want to ask a few more questions to ground us right here in the present. I see my friend Stan, the man who's sitting right here in Snellville with us. Stan, good morning. Good morning, Terrell. Good morning, Matt. That's the man in my Daily Huddle family. Good morning. What time is it, Stan? And who will you be hugging today? Man, the time is now, brother. Time, the only time that we have, now. And I'm gonna be hugging my daughter, my grandkids today. Uh, group hug, include me from a distance. Sure will, man. <laughs> will do. Good morning, Stacy. Good morning, my friend. How are you? Where are you, Stacy? I am right where I need to be with my Daily Huddle family on this beautiful Friday morning. You are here. And what are you grateful for? You know what? I am grateful for the opportunity to have my wife and both my children uh, right here with me in, in North Carolina. I'm very, very grateful for that. You are a lucky man. Mm -hmm. Give them a couple of hugs for me. I sure will. I will. I didn't get to do it yesterday, so I will do it today. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Chase, I have a question for you, my friend. I have an answer for you, my friend. How are you, Chase? I am spectacular. Thank you so much for asking. Indeed, you are the way you say you are. That's it. I kept it short and sweet for you. I, I know. You say something else, you'll be that way. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being part of this phenomenal conversation. And uh, we begin this conversation with a restatement of our question for the day. How do we connect theoretical diversity, equity, and inclusion ideals to everyday actionable steps? Uh, joining us today is my good friend, Bertine Crevecoeur West, who is the CEO of Westbridge Solution, a certified diversity, a certified diversity executive, uh, executive ad advisor, corporate trainer, award-nominated podcast host, and best-selling author. Thirteen established her company, Westbridge Solutions, a boutique management consulting firm in 2014. She's facilitated trainings and seminars throughout the world, North America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. 
She speaks, she leads conferences, keynote speeches, she's on panels. Bertine serves the corporate and academic and service industry and nonprofit sectors. She's been featured on CBS, NBC, and Fox, as well as numerous podcasts and international media, such as this, The Daily Huddle. Bertine's a very good friend, but what I do know about Bertine that I want to tell you is that what she's doing is her passion project. Wherever she is, she's intentional about making sure that people get, really get, diversity, equity, and inclusion for what it really is. And I'm delighted that you're here, Bertine. Welcome to the Daily Huddle again. Good morning. Good morning, Sorrel. Thank you for that introduction. It's so weird to hear about oneself, but I want to say it's great to be back on the Daily Huddle and to be here with the Daily Huddle family. So good morning to everyone joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live. Yeah, good morning. You know, Bertine, uh, you and I were speaking yesterday, uh, chatting about how this conversation would roll. And the first thing that came to us was that uh, in many instances, people even diversity professionals have a serious misconception of what diversity, equity, and inclusion is. And we're here today to debunk all the myth <laughs> and set the world straight. So start for us with this. Could you start with what DEI is not? What is it not? DEI is not and should not be first left out of the lexicon. We have to say the words and stop treating it like it's a, a dirty term or a politicized term. And then we have to understand its role and its purpose. So diversity, equity, and inclusion um, doesn't mean just having different faces. And so for me, what I've sought to do throughout my DEI career is to really flip the traditional paradigm on its head. Uh, most people lead with diversity, and that has proven time and again to fail. Uh, we, when you have different people in a room, that's great. But so what? What are you going to do with that? How are you going to harness the power of each individual? And how are you going to share this human experience to make sure everyone benefits, right, in a way that's appropriate for them? So what we do here at Westbridge and my, my sincere belief, and, and really I live it in my personal life as well as my professional, is to lead with inclusion. When you lead with inclusion and create inclusive spaces for people, for every everyone, all sorts of people from different walks of life and different beliefs, then you can create equity. Equity refers to, in my opinion, um, in my professional opinion, policies, practices, and procedures. Once you have those in play, then you create a sense of belonging, a sense of community and alignment if you're at an, a company with the vision and mission of the company, and then organic diversity. So that's how that should be. And so I always want people to understand um, the differences between equity and equality. They're not the same thing. We don't need the same thing, but we do need to make sure that everyone has access to equal opportunity. But say a little bit more about what you call the traditional paradigm. If you were to bottle up this traditional paradigm in one or two phrases that have become cliche, and yet it's like they're so cliche, people just swallow them as if that's what it is. And once I have absorbed that or drink that Kool-Aid, I'm good. So how would you bottle up the existing paradigm? So I love that question, Sorel. The existing paradigm as such is that um, it's, it's really based in performative action. So hire this amount of looking people or this particular ethnic group or racial group, um, you know, make sure we have the boxes checked, um, make sure that, you know, we have a training. People always roll their eyes at DEI trainings. I will tell you, I'm the first to roll my eyes about DEI trainings because those are one-offs and they do not work. Um, D 
DEI should be data driven. And for anybody that knows me, uh, they know that I love live and breathe data. Um, data tells us historically where we've been, where we are right now with current trends, and it serves as the catalyst for where we can be in the future. Data helps us make decisions that are effective, impactful, and sustainable. So the traditional paradigm does not take that into account. It takes our feelings. And as um, Dr. Frank Levin is my favorite poli sci professor in college said, uh, feelings are nice, but your facts matter as well. And so facts mm -hmm. are just data. So it's really important for us to move away from that because um, it's not a training. This should be strategic. Uh, DEI is a strategic business tool. And so if you don't have strategy, you can't implement policies or practices or procedures. So the manner in which we at Westbridge uh, train DEI, handle DEI. Yes, thank you, Michael, my friend from Amsterdam joining us today. <laughs> data people all up in here. So, um, and Michael shares my my love of data um, because it's it helps us. But, um, you know, the way that... Um, the way that DEI should be rolled out from the executive level um, should be about strategy and the business imperative. The way it should be rolled out on the managerial level should deal with interactions um, with, well, how to lead teams, especially diverse teams. If you have two people in a room, you have diversity. Um, and so the way we would roll that out with the workforce are day-to-day -day interactions with one another. So even the traditional paradigm, the way it's rolled out DEI is a cookie cutter, one size fits all. The CEO cares about profitability. The, the employee, the staff member cares about a sense of belonging and feeling heard and seen. And the manager wants to understand how to make everyone work effectively and efficiently. All these three components matter. Each of these groups matter, but the way to roll out DEI for them should always be different, and it's not been so. Uh, uh, as you were speaking, uh, Bertine, I heard you say the acronym DEI at least 10 times. Yes, I will always say it. <laughs> <laughs> and at the beginning, you said let's not treat it as just a three-letter word. Let's spell it out. Let's say diversity. Let's say equity. Let's say inclusion. Were you actually signaling that you're going to say those three words every time you want to refer to that space? No. What I'm actually saying, and I love that question, what I'm actually saying is I'm going to live and breathe and employ and implement those words. So we can use the acronym ad infinitum. We can use it always, but we need to do something more. We need to actually make sure that we're not just checking a box. We really need to follow up on our policies. And, and this looks different um, for us all. Uh, for small business owners, it's going to look a particular way. Um, it's going to look different than it would for, let's say, Coca-Cola right? Um, but each person, whether you're a solopreneur or the head of a large organization, you can implement DEI in a way that's beneficial to your company and responsive to your clients and your customers. So you're touching on a point that's very germane to our audience of small business owners and solopreneurs. And I would say in the, in, in the traditional paradigm where I'm checking a box I'm making sure I have X number of this color, X number of that gender, X number of that ethnic group and all. Uh, a solopreneur says, gosh, you know, I don't have anything to do. I'm good. Uh, now, <laughs> however, uh, what I'm hearing you say is that the kind of strategic approach and strategic thinking you're saying DEI demands is something that's also critical for small business owners and solopreneurs. So uh, taking some of the theoretical terms and uh, approaches from the DEI world and mapping it in reality to small businesses, if there were three things that you would say that a solopreneur and uh, the small business owner can benefit greatly from integrating DEI into what they're doing and who they are and what the business represents, what would you say? Well, I would first say for them to reimagine and reframe what they think they know about DEI, right? Um, and that 
that means for any business, um, because I am at, at my heart um, a business strategist. So DEI finds its way into there, of course. So for any business, especially a small business, you have to remain agile and innovative. That means you have to be solutions oriented and learning centered. You can be a company of one and still do these things. So the first thing I would suggest is to first know your clientele. So my favorite quote is from Socrates who says, know thyself. So for the small business owner and for the solopreneur, know thy company and, and know what your company does, know your mission statement, know your vision statement and revamp it if necessary to be an inclusive one. That's the first thing I would suggest. The second practical step would be to know your clients and your customers. It's really important for you to do that, that there are many ways to do that. And once you find the way that works for you, that could be looking at census data, who do you serve? What's the what's the radius? Look for a 10 mile radius of who you might serve or a 20 mile radius. Who are the people in your neighborhood as Mr. Rogers used to say, right? Um, for me, Mr. Rogers was a DEI OG and nobody knew it. So <laughs> who are the people in your neighborhood? Who do you serve? So once you see that, the third thing to do is to make your promotional materials reflective of the customers that you serve. When people see themselves in your, well, on your website, in your social media posts, in your marketing collateral, when they are able to see themselves, then they will feel an alignment to you. And they will, there's a degree of that know, like, and trust factor that you can build without ever meeting them. This is how you attract new customers as well. People talk, word of mouth. My business has grown because of word of mouth. You don't see commercials for us, but if you did, believe it, that there would be representation for everyone that we serve. So the next thing, I'll give you even a fourth, a bonus. So, That's a bonus. Bonus, yeah. Yeah, let's have a bonus round. So the next thing that I would suggest you do is look at your LinkedIn profile. Look at your Facebook profile. Are you, you know, for me, you'll always see that I use my pronouns. Now, what this does, yes, is let you know how to refer to me and address me, but this also signals and cues other people who like the use of their pronouns. It very much matters to them that I am open to doing business with them, that my company is here to serve their needs. You don't have to run through the street shouting DEI all day. You have to live it, you have to breathe it, and you have to be it. And you can do this in simple ways every single day. You know, uh, that that sounds perfect. Four very actionable steps from the world of the theory of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I, I would you connect it to your business for me? Uh, would you you would you classify your business as a small business or a solopreneur? I was a solopreneur and now I'm a small business. And so now you're a small business. Yeah. So you've gone through these spaces as well. And you've, you've not just tried what you're advocating on your business and on yourself, you've actually implemented it successfully. So uh, if you would pick one or two, give us a sense of how your business was before the implementation of that and how it is after and the results that showed up that were, you could say, miraculous. Well, I will say this, um, wherever I have gone in the world, I've been an other because there's nobody quite like me. That's true for each and every single one of us. What is yeah, your, your name alone does that for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So what is the thing that I would encourage uh, small business owners and solopreneurs to think about? What is the thing that makes you unique? We each have something. Right. And so is that reflected in your website? something as simple as a website. Is that reflected in your website? It doesn't matter if it's a one-page website or a 30-page website. Is it reflected? And when you're able to shine that light on your particular brand of uniqueness, now, how are you going to communicate that to everyone, right? So I would say first, look at your website and, and see your unique unique um, value proposition, right? So going back to business school for a minute, right? See what your UVP is and then make sure that you highlight that. Too often, um, small businesses try to be like everybody else, right? So we can look big. But yeah, we have to pause for a second mm -hmm. because I, I hear something and, and I want to make sure you integrate in what you're saying. Don't lose your train of thought. Uh-oh, too late now. <laughs> too late? Well, you, you'll create no, it again. Okay. 
<laughs> but here's the thing, right? You say, when you say unique value proposition, I think people usually go to something that is about my services or products, mm -hmm. as opposed to something that is about me mm -hmm. as the one who is delivering the services or products. What would you say is your UVP from that perspective, where you say, I've always been another? Well, I will say this. Maya Angelou said, people may not remember your name, but they will remember how you made them feel. So oftentimes people say, oh yeah, DEI this, and, and there are tons of you guys out there. Now, all of us have 10 fingers, but not all of us are a concert pianist. I played violin for five years and my son plays piano. Put a piano in front of me, I can't help you right? But give me a violin and then I can shine with that. So what I say to everyone is think about you and how you deliver those services. We can all, as small business owners, talk about business, but if I bring Bertine into the business, if you bring Sorel into the business, you are the UVP. You might have the same services as someone, but I guarantee you we will not deliver it in the same way. Simply because we, first because of intersectionality, we are multiple things. We are layered onions, right? So we're not always going to have the same experience. A quick example of that would be you and I, Sorel. We are both Black people. So racially, we have this commonality. We happen to both be Haitian. So ethnically, we have that commonality. But we are two different genders. We are different ages. We have different amounts of children. You are a proud grandparent, right? So there are spaces for us to be different. So the way that you'll approach a particular topic will differ very much so from me, uh, simply by sheer virtue of our different lived experiences, even though we share these various commonalities. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to open it up for questions. But right before we do, I'd like to take a little personal twist. You're so passionate about what you do, that I'm thinking in the back of my mind that something must have triggered and ignited that passion for you personally. What was that? Well, I, I think it's important for people to see you as you authentically are. And oftentimes when people see me, they make many assumptions about who I am. Um, when they hear my voice on the phone, they equate it to a completely different looking person. And then when they meet me, I've always gotten oh, <laughs> right? And so I'm just like, huh, I wonder what's behind those perceptions and naturally stereotypes, right? Um, but it's better for us to make generalizations. So I would say I've always been um, just a lover of people and, and conversations. And growing up, I was very, very shy. So now to speak in front of audiences of hundreds of people, it's it's always something that, that I'm very grateful for. Um, I was shy around people other than my family, I should say. And nobody would guess that now. But it's because of this, this desire to see people as they are, to have them see me for who I am, and to create spaces for people. Um, my older brother happens to be, well, one of my older brothers and one of many, um, but he happens to be on the autism spectrum. My son is also on the autism spectrum, but they are very different individuals. And so for me, that is also a part of what propels me forward to create inclusive spaces where we can recognize the gifts of other individuals. There are many diverse, well, there are many components to diversity. Everyone has the right to be seen, heard, and valued. After all, we are all human, aren't we? Most definitely. Most definitely. I'm opening it up for questions right now. Get ready, folks. Take a little piece of Bertine. Hi, Gio. <laughs> Come on, Gio. Great to be here. Thank you, Bertine, for coming. Thank you for coming back. It's so great to see you, and it's so refreshing to see you. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, I've Lately, I've had... Um, one of the I've had a, I've had a personal challenge with the world diversity and inclu inclusion and equity. It used it used to be for me something that I was all out. Like everywhere I went, it was about the expression of humanity. And then uh, in my experience now, it's like it there is there is a pendulum in some degree, and it's gone way more now. And now it is uh, scary to talk about it. And now it is scary to not be um, 
sensitive enough to the possibility of the conversation and um and then and then some of the values and some of the some of the views and what needs to be included is now beyond my my own understanding now and i was wondering um as a, as a person who's in that field, because I'm not in that field, how do you manage now the sensitivity of people who are definitely not going to tell you because it's so scary now you, you can get fired. So they're going to be like, however, um, or maybe maybe not anymore, but I don't know, people, people do get fired for not getting where the pendulum is now and how is there a balance, you know? Is there now balancing the conversation? Yeah. Actually, so I will say this. Um, I am a multilingual person. While I was born in America, I didn't speak English until I was five. And so um, with that in mind, um, speaking four languages, my true north has always been linguistics and language. When we understand language and what terms actually mean, rather than politicize them, be fearful of them, um, all of the, the feelings that we can bring, when we look at the terms what they actually mean, this is how I guide those conversations and, and honestly win people's trust. But I will say this, um, everyone has a sensitivity. The DEI space is not meant to be one of comfort. Um, I speak in places where I know I, sometimes I'm not welcome. It is not always a safe and, and comfortable environment. So I intentionally live in the uncomfortability so people don't have to, but they must sit in it. If we don't, if, if we walk around with rose-colored glasses, uh, we're not going to see pr problems that each of us suffers from or deals with or, or has to endure. So even when we're talking about um, things such as equity, when we're talking about equity, equity for me is equity for us all. So that's the, that's the problem that I tend to see. And that's where the fear comes from. People think it's a zero sum game. If we talk about this and we talk about elevating a particular group, then uh oh, my piece of the pie is gone. But it is not something that is finite. It is infinite. So when you uplift any particular member of an underrepresented group, and that could be anyone, it doesn't have to be one person or one stereotypical view, right? So when you when you uplift people in this manner, we all benefit. I will give you a very quick example, if you'll allow me. Um, if we're thinking about education, we have to make classrooms um, inclusive. And by that, I mean the type of education that we teach our children in public schools in particular. We have to teach them actual history, right? Not something that is sanitized, not something that is made to make people feel good. That is not the point of learning about history. History tells us where we've been. It is data. It tells us what mistakes that we've made and how we can avoid those in the future. But here's what happens when you um, make education equitable. Um, data has shown us that whatever affects Black people at any particular point in the socioeconomic uh, strata will affect also poor white children. So anything to benefit me as a child or my son for that matter, because he is a student, will also uplift anyone who is poor, who is white, and who happens to be in public school. This is the equitable piece that we're talking about. So there's no piece of the pie that anyone is missing. When we ensure that Asian Americans and Asian people living in the United States um, are protected from minority model myth, then we ensure that we do away with stereotypes for us all. These things are important and they matter. And this is why it's, this is why people like me will stay in the uncomfortable spaces, but we ask that you sit with us in there for a while so we can really look at language, decode it, and then debunk it. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects that um, I can see in the marketplace, and, um, and maybe it's here, is that the debate has become so politicized that it seems that it is mostly a game of guilt and shame. And that um, prevents the intellectual uh, effort to appreciate 
the opportunity that equity is, inclusion is for all of us, like you're pointing to. Well, and that so has many points, Gio. So I will say this, um, I have a master's degree and a bachelor's in political science, and I was also a political science professor for five years. And I'm also Catholic. So I, I say this to attack this question in a particular way. So as a Catholic- Did you person, say attack this question? That's right, attack this question. <laughs> the question, <laughs> not the questioner. So with regard to that, Catholics um, tend to be, well, they, shame is something that's woven into the faith right, into the religion. So I am one of those Catholic people that says, um, and I'm quoting Phil Donahue, so I'm, I'm really showing my age here, but guilt is a useless emotion. It, it, is, it is a feeling and it has no place in the conversation. And one thing I tell people, carry your own luggage. I am not going to feel guilty about conversations because that's how we're going to get somewhere. But then on the political science side, um, politics uh, should not be brought into the conversation because then it changes the nature and the meaning of the word. So these are two things that I liberate people from when I am speaking to them because it is something that enshackles us and enslaves us all. Guilt and shame do not belong in the DEI conversation and neither does uh, politics. Those things can be kept separate. Um, I have friends uh, from all walks of life. Some of them I disagree with very much on politics, but will I, will I fight for their right rights to be included in conversations, be included in spaces. Absolutely, I will. The, the point of DEI is not to make me feel comfortable, nor us all. It is to make us feel valued. And that is what really leads to DEI success. Mm. Thank I you like it. I like for it. the conversation, Gio. And thank you for thoughtfully and carefully answering, uh, Bertine. We've got <laughs> one last question. Stan? Hi, thank you, Bertine. Thank you, family. What would you say in the various the various things that have to be managed today and change in the in the in, in the work environment around DEI? What would you say is the greatest challenge to actually bring in that to bring in that type of awareness and that type of a change about corporately? Thank you, Stan. So, um, and I'm going to break that down. Um, for the corporate sector, but also for solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. So from the corporate sector, it's very important again for us to get clear about language, but also you may hear of the business case for diversity. It's been proven time and time again, but what is important is to first start from the top. Leaders must lead, but we must empower them to lead in this particular way in space. I've met many leaders um, that, that talk about DEI, and yet behind closed doors, they tell me they don't even know what equity means, right? So again, it's, it's really important for us to liberate them from that, right, by providing them with education around language, but then strategy and how to implement those strategies. And so every organization can benefit from that. When you show leaders the profitability that can occur because happy employees are productive employees, this doesn't mean giving everybody what they want. This means giving everyone what they need. And those are two different things, but one leads to success. I can want chocolate cake all day, but is it what I need? No, sometimes I need a vegetable. So that is one way to look at that. Now from the solopreneur and entrepreneurial end, one of the things that we must do, and I, I can't stress this enough, is refrain from performative measures. I'll use the example of George Floyd. Um, when he was tragically murdered, um, one thing I saw so much on Facebook was black screens or, or fist um, raised in the air. That is performative. And while I understand that people run to that um, because they want to show support, that doesn't show me any sort of support. What shows me support is data. So what I would do if I were posting something of that nature, um, I would post, you know, this, this specific fact. So I'll use a small business that was um, a school, like they were tiny um, comic book uh, company and they trained students on how to draw comics. One of the things that, that they did, they were one that put up the fist. And so when I did a quick audit of their, their social post, um, I told them this is what they could do because their Black students were, were, were hurt by that because they thought it was performative. They knew it was. So I said, well, rather than do that, why don't you get some data and say, this is how we support our Black students and Black Lives Matter here at XYZ Company because 
40% or 25% of our students are Black um, or identify as Black. Um, this is what we do to encourage inclusive enrollment in our school. These are our percentages. This is how many of our students graduate. This is how we support them after graduation. What you're telling me then is that you're paying attention. What you're telling me is that you collected the data, you were intentional about it, and that's how you're showing me in that particular post that Black Lives Matter. It takes four facts. It can take a picture if you want, but that means so much more to anyone than a blanked out screen or a fist. Mm. In, in, in the context of creating this answer, Bertine, you use the word performative. Mm -hmm. Think I know what it means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in closing, I'd love for you to say, what is it to be performative? Well, to be performative, and thank you for asking that, Sorrel. Um, so to be performative means to jump through hoops, to do what we think people want to see, to check a box, to um, think about um, when, you, when you're invited to go someplace and you go, but you really don't want to go. So you're not bringing your best foot forward. You're going to dip in. You're going to say, hi, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm, and then you're going to leave, right? But what happens when you actually want to go to someplace? You're going to think about what you're going to wear, you're going to look forward to getting there, you're going to engage with the crowd once you get there, you're going to show up as your very best self, and people will feel that, right? So performative is just literally um, doing the action, but the intention is not there. When you're not being performative, when you're being authentic and intentional, your intent what, what you say that you want to do is going to be in alignment with your impact, what you actually did, and how you made people feel. So being performative is the polar opposite of being authentic. I got it. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Gio, I, I felt during the last interaction, you had something else to say. I hope you didn't forget it. So I'm throwing the mic to you to give you the opportunity to close the show and say that. Thank you, Sorrel. No, I uh, I am complete. Thank you, um, Berthine, for being here and for addressing my questions in such a profoundly um, professional way. And thank you all for being here. Thank you for taking your time to be here at the Daily Huddle. I love you. Sorrel loves you more. Sorrel, do you want to end the day or you want me to do it? You go ahead and end the day, Jill. Okay, fine. I love it when you say, hug the trees, eat the trees. <laughs> yes, thank you. In a world where we are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, in a way in which Berthine says it, addressing the possibility of each word, not to the emotion that currently is in the space. The Daily Huddle and the entire Daily Huddle family recommends that you love, love, love always, love those who you have an opinion about, love, love those who you disagree with, love those who attack your questions. Love, eat more plant-based, get closer to the trees, hug the trees, eat the trees, let the animals live, let them die when they die. Let other animals eat other animals. Sleep, at least seven hours, you can't sleep, open up a book, you'll see, your brain will send you to sleep. Move, move every day, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes after lunch, move every day, 20 minutes, it's really healthy. Laugh out loud, stretch your cheeks, stretch it. It helps you with the wrinkles, it helps you to stay sexy. And always, always, always give. Give what you have, give it all, give it all away. You're not taking it anywhere. And check yourself before you wreck yourself. I love you, Sora, I love you more. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Daily Huddle family. Thank you, Bertine. Beautiful day, everybody. Beautiful. Bye.